I want to teach you how to sell more books, but I'm having a really, really hard time believing in this message because you're not practicing what you're preaching. You're not practicing the title. I would prefer you write a book about your experience in prison, but you're building a business off of a message that I don't think has any depth. Explain love in your perspective. Love for me is you suck, your business sucks, and you'll never be successful. How many people paid you five grand? You never lied to anybody? Okay, real quick. Anything you see in here? What? It's over, bro. Mm. What's your belief system? You're married, yes? To a woman? Or you let your wife wear pants? When I ask you for something and you don't give it to me, are you knowing that you're lying to me? Lying? You Real cannot you move being this comfortable. But you be in the crib and your drawers just like, hey, yo. My job is to make you fail. My job is to make you quit. My job is to make you cry. But if you survive it, success is on the other side. Hi. How's it going? Peace and blessings. How you feeling? Very blessed. Peace and blessings. I like that, man. What's your name? Ibrahim Malesi. I go by I am for short. Ibrahim Malesi. Malesi. But you go to you go by I am. Yes, sir. Short. Sure. Is that Muslims change their name, right? Is that a part? Is that a, is that is that what's happening? Uh, actually, I was born with the name Ibrahim. I reverted my last name while I was in prison to reflect more of my father's culture. My father's Ethiopian. Word. I'm, so that's the I am part you're talking about? Nah, so the I am is my name abbreviated. My entire name is Ibrahim Abdullah Hadi Jaz Malisi. You got so, a name. <laughs> <laughs> that's guys don't know. It flows. It flows yeah. for sure. I'm from Philly. So my mother, you know, we all go about it. Most of us have Arabic names in Philly. Oh, yeah. 100%. Where your beard? My beard. In the nation, we're not allowed to have beards. I thought, because you know, in, in Muslim, I mean, in, in Philly, it's a lot of Muslims there. Yeah. But they all have beards, no? Most of them go by the Orthodox faith. In the Orthodox, they wear the beard. But in the nation of Islam, we don't wear beards nor long hair. Really? Why? Militant, a militant composure, but also in the Quran, in believe Sora 47 to 48, it tells us the man should be clean shaven when he enters the mosque. For us, the mosque isn't just a building. A mosque is the earth itself. It's a holy environment. So we always keep a clean shaven demeanor. Mm, okay. Yeah. So I, I honestly, forgive my ignorance. I was, I was, you, you think like, oh, you're Muslim, right? Because you have a beard or, uh, okay. And he, also, y'all can't wear gold, right? Or is that a different? In a sense, in certain, we have what's called sunnahs. They're said to be the practices of the prophet. They're supposed to be based off the Quran. In certain sunnahs you have, people believe we're not supposed to wear gold, mainly because men shouldn't be over luxuriant. We're supposed to be humble. Got it. In some aspects, you'll see brothers who come from the Muslim faith, they do wear gold because of our African roots. Mm. For me personally, I believe it's in a person's preference. Okay, just preference. I, the only reason I'm asking, one of my friends, I was looking for a watch one, one time. So actually, this one right here, actually. It's a nice and, watch. Ah, uh, thanks. You wouldn't wear it, though. I would. I would. You would? Like, yes, I would. Okay, anyway, so he said, the guy, the, the person, he, he has a dealer at, his, at the store. So when his dealer calls and says, hey, we got this piece, he'll buy it. But he said he can't wear it. So he, like, sold it to me because he said, in the Muslim faith, you couldn't wear gold. But I'm understanding that there's a difference. Yeah, more so that's in the line where you're not supposed to be over luxuriant. You're not supposed to be just flashing. You're supposed to always be humble at all times. Got it. Now, with the beard, it's in the sunnah. The prophet told brothers they should have beards, but it, beards more see signifies wisdom. Mm. But most people, they wear the beard just because the prophet had one. And they believe in Islam, you have to have the beard because the prophet had one, which is not necessarily true. It's like you'll see a lot of brothers who wear the long garments because right. they said the prophet wore one, but the prophet was an Arab that lived in a climate where if you wear pants, you probably finna sweat to death. Got it. So it was right. more so a cultural significance that's just been imprinted onto the religion, Got but it. it's itself is not really a religious practice. Got it. Okay. And it seems like you're pretty devout. So. Yes, sir. Okay, good. And you said you, you went to prison. Yeah. When prison changed your name. The last name when I reverted the last name. Oh, gotcha. Okay. 
Why'd you go to prison? You said why? Yeah. Tagged along with a robbery. We got charged with an armed robbery, even though it wasn't an armed robbery. And you tagged along with a robbery? Yes, sir. How old are you? 28. Just turned 28. October 6th. How long were you in prison? Seven years. Seven years. Actually, October 5th marks my one year out of prison. October 6th is my birthday. Congratulations, man. Welcome back home. Peace. I came here for your Grow Your Business Summit. So, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. For sure, for sure. The place looks different without a lot of chairs. Oh, yeah, no doubt. Goodness gracious. Seven years in prison. Yeah, seven straight. And what did you learn in prison? I learned that I didn't know anything about life before going in prison. It just took me about my fourth year, fourth or fifth year in prison to realize I didn't have no real experiences. I grew up in the hood, so you know. Yeah, you're 21. Limited experience. Point. Even that, like, I never really had an open mind to anything. Like when I got out, one of the first things I did was go ice skating. I never went ice skating before, even when I had opportunities, I used to say that's white people stuff. Yeah, for sure. And I realized like, it's skating. Yeah, it's There's skating, nothing sure. ethnic about it. Why'd you go along on the robbery though? We're gonna get into your business, but why'd you go along on the robbery? I had already started robbing people here in Atlanta. I got locked up in Arkansas. I was going to college out there. Dang. I was out there my three and a half months before I caught my charge. So I'd already had a reputation. Oh, so you was robbing people for sure. Yeah, I wasn't a crazy robber, but but you try to paint it like you just went with. So he was like, I was I tagged along on a robbery, and then in my mind I'm thinking, oh, this brother man, he just happened to be in the car, he just happened to go. But no, and that, you were and the, that you hit, were the and, villain. No, and that hit. That's actually how it was. Now other situations back home, those weren't those situations. Really. Long story short, we're in college. You know, we go boosting for extra cash. My co-defendant seen some people that had a lot of bread on them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I seen them, too, but I'm not even thinking about that because I'm not out, I'm not on that out here. Right. But he said, we can get away with this. None of us are from out here. Mask the face up real quick. We can get away with this. I'm thinking, like, I'm not from here. Don't nobody know me. I can get away with this. Yeah. Besides, I didn't want to seem like the weak one out the group who didn't want to do it. So Got it. I tagged along. You weren't scared, though. Scared? I was nervous. I had this gut rich and feeling that something just don't feel right about this, yeah. but I wasn't willing to listen to that feeling. Yeah. Goodness gracious. So it was three of y'all? Four of us, but th four of us, one was a driver, two other people, but only one of us actually had to do the robbery. That wasn't you? Nah, I was more so I was just staying by just in case it went further than when it had to. Got it. Got it. And how'd you get caught? The driver. Hold on, first of all, are you allowed to talk about this? Ah, yeah. It's I'm, over with. Yeah, I'm cool. Serve your time. Okay, cool. The driver. I don't want to incriminate nobody. You know what I mean? Nah, nah, I'm cool. The driver parked her car. It was a girl. Yeah. She's a gangster. No, she's not. She, no, she's not. The girl parked her car in a driver. Hold on, real quick. Was the girl dating one of the guys? No, this was. Let me be straight. I only knew one out of four of the people. I didn't know the other two people. I didn't know the other two. One guy bought weed from him a couple times and the girl, that was my first time ever seeing her. <laughs> wow. And they didn't even know my name except the person that knew me. That's how they got me. The person who knew me. Wow. Okay. So she parked her car at a drive through bank. <laughs> <laughs> So Man. they ran. So the U.S. Marshals ran the, all the nearby cameras, and they seen her car, and they seen when she drove off, and then they placed it around the same time when we ran the meet up with her. Then they just simply did a backspace on everywhere we've been because we was in the same area that we seen the people in. Got it. Got Matter of fact, we went to the Walmart to go boost. We robbed them at IHOP. The IHOP right next door to the Walmart. So they just ran all the cameras and they started with her. Wow. Then they got my co-defendant, who was my best friend at the time. He told them where I worked at. So clearly <gasps> we not best friends no more. He snitched on you. Oh, uh, yeah. And this is how you know when somebody didn't gave you up. As they bring us into the interrogation, which was kind of odd because they was interrogating us at the college and I don't know why. As they're bringing him out the room, I'm about to come in. He looked at me and he did this. And I knew it was over. I said, I'm gone. Dang. I get in there. They had a picture of me that only people who know me can get this picture. So when I said, I said, yeah, it's over with. Man. They got me. Seven years in prison. Yeah. He got about three or four. 
He got three or four because yeah. he told on you. That they put us in a situation where they only needed two of us to take the armed robbery charge since the woman said only two people robbed her. My other co-defendant, he wasn't even finna take the trial. He said, I'm just going to take the time. It is what it is. How much time was that? Seven also. Seven. My best friend, who was the one who actually robbed her, once we read the statement and he was seen, he put everybody under the bus. He let it be known. I ain't going to prison for nobody. So the situation was either I can catch the stand on him or give him the opportunity to catch the stand on me. I'm not catching the stand for nobody. I'm going to take some accountability. I'm just going to take the time. That gave him some leniency for he was just an extra body now. That gave him a simple robbery charge. He had to do like three years. Wow. Would you, if you could do it all over again, would you just tell on him? No. Hey, listen, let me just make this public service announcement. <laughs> to all of my friends, if we decide to rob somebody, I'm telling. I got kids. I don't live by the streets anymore. I used to be a rapper. This was like 15 years ago. <laughs> what am I, 30? If this was 20 years ago, I would say something totally different. I'm just going to take it, stand like a man. I listen, I think you're going to tell on me anyway, so I got to beat you. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I would. First off, I'm not robbing nobody. No. Okay? So we don't have to worry about this, but I'm just letting you know, if I ever change and my life changes and I really got to do what I got to do, Reese, if I come to you with a plan, don't trust me. Okay? <laughs> I'm telling on you, bro. If it comes down to me or you, it's over with. See, the reason I yeah. wouldn't do it, it has nothing to do with the street rules. I think the street rules sets almost everybody up for disaster. For sure. It has to do with accountability within itself. Mm -hmm. I'm a firm believer in if you can't take the consequences, you don't need to be doing it. That was one of the things I had to learn in prison when detrimental situations happened. I'd ask people for advice, like, how should I handle this? What should I do? And one of the realest advice I ever got was from a guy who I consider one of my father figures. He said, I could tell you what I would do. But first, you need to ask yourself, can you live with my consequence? Mm. And I thought about that because he let it be known. I can kill somebody real quick in here. I'm cool with being stuck in prison. Can you? All right. And that's simple. So that's how I feel about anything. If I can't live with the consequence behind this, I don't need to be doing this. Nah, this is good. Not going to say I've lived by that law perfectly. Yeah, for sure. But I'm a firm believer. If you can't stomach the outcome of what this could possibly be, this is not for you. Got little homeboys all the time. They tell me, e, I can't do no prison time. Yeah. I tell them, y'all don't need to be committing no crime because you're going to prison probably. Uh, 100%. Woo, okay. <laughs> Man. Well, you're here, so you can live with the consequences of this conversation. So. Oh, uh, yes. You're I an entrepreneur? Working on it. Working on it. What do you want to do? Right now, I'm in the process of selling a book. I'm a self-published author. I wrote a book called Dad, I Love You, How to Love an Absent Father. Had a love an absent father. But you are an absent son. I had an absent father. And I was an absent father myself. I went to prison when my son was a baby. And you're an absent son. You left your mom or dad. Mother. You left your mother. When did your dad leave? When I was five. And you're now cool with your dad. No, I called him when I got out of prison so I could touch so we can finally link up. He hung up on me. You love him? Of course. Nah. How? I had to humanize my father's situation. Like, I don't know why he left. Sorry, real quick. The one that told on you, you love him? No. I don't hate him, but I don't love him. So you love someone who left you when you were five but you don't love someone who made you sit in prison for seven years i'm trying to understand how you're teaching how to love an absent father when you just got out how do you how do you love this man or are you just going off? I love everybody. I, got, I love you. I just met you. I love you as a person. So let me clarify when I say this. I can say I have love for my code of I don't have no animosity behind them. When I first, bit. Nah, when I first a got incarcerated, bit. when I first got incarcerated, I went to Arkansas. Arkansas is different than any other prison. They usually keep you away from your code of especially in that situation. Arkansas does not operate that way. There's a chance you will be in the same prison with your code of Did you see him? 
no, I'd let it be known real quick. If I see, I'm going to kill him in prison. Yeah. The first four years. But then I really thought about it. I said, one, nobody made me do what I did. I put myself in that situation. And three, he was actually honest. He let it be known. This is who he is. Gotcha. Now, how you be mad at somebody when they are showing you this is who they are and they tell you. Okay. You call but, your dad after a certain while and he hangs up on you. I'm trying to understand how you love an absentee father. That's the name of the book, right? How to love yeah. an absentee father. How to love an absent father. How to love an absent father. How? So tell me how you love your absent father. Because me and my father, we wanted the same. A child is a reflection of their parents. So in a hint, when you have any type of animosity or disdainful feelings towards a parent, you're still a reflection of them, particularly a son of his father. Well, I look just like my father to the T from what I've been told. Told I have particular character traits, which I don't want to discuss. I understand that. But actually, the love part is, it sounds odd, but I understand. I, here's my thing. Maybe you don't hate them, but love someone that left you when you were five as a grown man. I'm not saying you have a grudge against them and you're, you know, holding something. I'm not saying you hate them, but I'm having a hard time understanding that you are the person to teach someone how to love someone who you're still not talking to. You don't know what you do when you see him. Am I right? He can come back anytime he wants to. For sure. But yeah. like I said, I understand that I understand that something happened inside him that caused him to leave. Like one of my father's from Ethiopia. So when I have this conversation with Ethiopia. Hold on one second. I understand this, right? But you let's say, for instance, your dad comes back into your life right now and y'all have a good conversation and y'all hang out and he comes to stay with you and y'all start building a relationship and you go to work, you come home and you realize all your stuff is gone and he robs you. Will I be angry? Of course. You'll still love him. Of course. But you don't, that's what I'm saying. If you're, if you are saying, I love people, like anybody, you do something wrong to me, I love you, I'm a forgiving person. I'm cool with that. If you said, do you love your co-defendant? You said yes, I'd be like, oh, bet. Then he probably does love his father because he's just a person who loves no matter what happens. But I don't, I, I can't believe that this is something that you have no experience in. And love isn't just saying you love somebody. Love is an action. And you haven't had the chance to even interact with this person. So you're going to write a whole bunch of stuff in a book and give it to somebody else and they may use it, but the stuff that you're talking about has not been practiced. So how can you teach somebody how to love an absent father when you have no, you have no application? There's no, you don't know if you love this person. It just sounds good because you haven't had a chance to face it, the situation. Well, I don't really have a reason to, despite the fact him leaving, I don't really have a reason to hate him. He never, he never did nothing to, love to me. Him either. You got more reasons to hate than love. Yeah. Way more. Give me the reasons to love. I'll give you the reasons to hate. And I'm not saying you should hate him. But I'm just, I'm just not buying the fact that you wrote a book teaching people how to love an absent father when you haven't gone through the process of trying to love an absent father. He hasn't even been around. So you can say whatever you want. You can say, I love the person. I'll do anything for it. But I can see if you call and he picks up, y'all start building a relationship and he does you wrong. And he comes back and says, hey, son, I need to borrow some money. And you give it to him. And then he does you wrong again. And then you help him again. And he does you wrong again. Now I can buy the fact that you're saying, I love an absent father. I love this man regardless. But you haven't been able to put it in practice. That's, that's my only issue right now. I knew I was going to like this. <laughs> I'm enjoying it too. I say in a sense, I've had a chance to put it in practice in his own way. Because Explain one, I was saying I loved my father before I even called him. You know, that was just my way of healing or rejuvenating from the wound of him not being yes. there. When I called him, the biggest downfall for that was the fact that I had an expectation because I reached out that he wanted to hear from me. Which 
isn't necessarily true because he's always known where I was at. Mm-hmm. Like even I know where he's at right now in Philly. Yeah. So he's always known. But when I called him expecting to speak to him, I set myself up for that. Now, whatever went wrong inside of him that caused him not to be there, that's really on him. Okay, hold on real quick. Had that call, he hangs up when you get out of prison, yeah. right? And I called him be- I called him twice. The Call first time he hung up, as soon as I told him I was. The second time I called back, he answered, but he just sat on the phone breathing the entire time, like nice. didn't say anything. Yep. So there's a part of me that felt like there's something in him that wants to say something, wants to do something. But then there's that part of him he won't let himself get past. For sure. Okay. And that was the last interaction you've had with him? Yes, sir. You have kids? Yeah, I have a son. You have a son? Do you talk to your son? Do I talk to my son? Yes. You're in your son's life? Yes. When was the last time you talked to him? Probably a few days ago. Okay. He lives in Philly? No, he lives here in Atlanta. He lives here in Atlanta? Yeah. How old is he? Eight. He'll be nine in December. You talk to him how often? Whenever his mother's not acting crazy. Oh, gotcha. One of them situations. And gotcha. Georgia apparently is very biased yeah. on their parental laws. Gotcha. Um, let's say there wasn't anything holding you back from getting with your son. You love your son, of course. Of Most definitely. If there was nothing standing in your way of going to see your son, would you see your son every day? Of course. I want him to live with me. A hundred percent. But you're telling me you called your dad twice and you know exactly where he is, but you have not gone to see him. This is what you're calling love? Actually, I, went to, I actually went up to Philly to see him. What happened? He wasn't there at the time. And, and since what? I was on a fixed number of days, I'm actually being there. Let's just, say he has, let's just say he has a problem. So running into him will probably be harder than what it is, but I know where he is living-wise. But actually running into him is a little bit more challenging. So because of his go, problem. Go knock on the door. He wasn't there. His roommate said he wasn't there. Okay. And then what do you say? I said, just give, give my number. I'm going to reach out. I want to find him. I want to talk to him. Good. And then what? That's it. Now, actually, now this, this is what I did wrong. And this is my fault right here. I changed my number the day afterwards because I had somebody call my phone stalking me. Yeah. So I didn't think about that. Because I'm thinking, man, why this man ain't called me? Then I thought I said I changed my number the next day. Yeah. Okay. Flip the scenario. Your son is eight. Your baby mother says, I don't say that. Child's my son's mother. Yes, your son's mother says your son isn't here right now. What would you do? I'm not going to personally believe her just because of prior experiences. Okay. Well, let's just say the child legit isn't there. What do you do? When is he going to be here? When work is he out. Be there? Let's work out me seeing him. But you did none of that with your dad's roommate. I'm just trying to understand your his, his idea. roommate didn't his roommate didn't want me there actually. I understand, but if this was me and this is a person that I'm saying I love and I'm building my whole business off of, I'm coming back a little later that day. I'm going to at least ask, okay, when is he home? I'm going to come that night. I'm going to come the next day. I'm going to like do my very best. Talk to some neighbors. I'm going to spend some time trying to find this person that I love. But you're building a business off of a message that I don't think has any depth. Well, in that situation, I'm trying to consider everybody's feelings that's involved at that moment. I went to go visit my- I am. Now, just hear me out, hear me out. I went to go visit my mother, because I haven't seen her since before I got locked up in prison, so naturally I want to see my moms. And she knows part of the reason I'm actually in Philly is to see my father. And I'm trying to be very conscious of her feelings. Like right now, me and my mother don't talk. When she found out I wrote the book, that was one of the things that ended the relationship. Mm. And mind you, I love my mother to death, but and I've been trying to get her to talk to me, but she don't respond. What is it about the book she didn't like? That was about my father. It was about your father. There's something deeper here. That's at that point, you gotta get on. I don't know what it is. That's what There's she said. There's a part to of me. the story you're not telling me. 
I, but there's something. It's not, oh, you wrote a book about your father? I'm done with you. I don't, I can't believe that. There's some other things, but that was the solidifier right there for her. Right, tell me the other things. I come from one of those family where everybody has secrets. Everybody dislikes each other. I'm not even against the idea that people in my family would actually try to harm each other, which they actually have through very violent means. At some point you get sick of growing up through that. I have kids now. My cousin have kids. We tired of growing through this. Mm -hmm. I spoke on something that had absolutely nothing to do with my mother. It was something about me. But my mother took it there. So that was the first part of it. She was starting to let up on it. But then when she found out I was coming out with the book, that's what solidified it right there. She said, oh, no, nah, I don't want to talk to you. I'm done. Explain love in your perspective. Love for me is this strong emotion. And I say for me because love means something different for everybody. But it's that strong feeling where I always have to be there for you. I always need to be there for you. I'm always going to care about you. There's relatively nothing you can do to wave that You're for. Not you. there for your dad right now. Are you? Yes. How? How are you there for your dad? You called twice, knocked on the door once. Cuz I understand what's going on. This is on me. He has to want this too. Mind you, I'm not the one that left. Yeah, I'm, I, I but I have, but I have it understood that if he comes, I'm not finna stop him. If he asks to meet my son, yes. I'm gonna let you meet him. But that's the one right there where there's a stipulation. I'm gonna tell him like, if you're not serious about being here, bro, don't be around my son. Yeah, no, like I you can it. hurt me as much as you it. want. The thing is, I'm, I'm a, I'm a coach, right? And I want to teach you how to sell more books. But I'm having a really, really hard time believing in this message because you're not practicing what you're preaching you're not practicing the title if you say love is a strong emotion or a strong feeling that's not love that's a feeling so is your book teaching you how to feel a different way about your father that's absent actually yeah it does how do you know how you're going to feel when you meet him you don't i'm just saying a book will be misleading so if somebody's really going through something, they're trying to create some sort of connection with this father that's been absent through their life and they're like kind of going back and forth in that relationship. The stuff in your book will either mislead people or it's just not necessarily going to work. So you can cause more harm than good with this book because you know nothing about it. I would prefer you write a book about your experience in prison or your 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 transformation of going from robbing people to being an astute young man right now. You seem very respectful, loving, humble. I, f I feel all that from you right now. Even when you told me you used to rob people, I was like, him? Nah. I, when he, that was a shocker, right? Like, you rob people, bro? You just seem so cool. You seem very respectable. I'm the best robbers. <laughs> Oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not still robbing people, right? No, okay. that's all behind me. Okay. Because that depends on how aggressively I had this conversation. Nah, like, nah. Come, <laughs> come back here. <laughs> all of y'all, okay? Hot seat, what I'll steal these nah. seats. Nah, ironically, I stay in the same area, and I can talk about it because I'm past my statute of limitations, so it don't yeah. matter. I stay right by the first store I ever robbed in my life. Hmm. Like you I live went, here in Atlanta, though, right? Yeah, I live in Atlanta. I live in East Point. But here's my this, this is what I would ask you to do. Write a different book. I think, just my perspective, this is a really good topic because there's a lot of people, maybe in prison, where you're sharing stories of people, especially in Philly, who have lost. Oh, no. I grew Arkansas. up here. Yeah, I grew up here in it. I grew up here in Atlanta. Oh, gotcha. I, okay. Yeah, I grew okay. up here in Atlanta. But in prison, there were probably a bunch of men who had absent fathers, right? Around. I'm going to tell you how far that goes when I was in prison. I watched firsthand five guys be locked up with their fathers. One of was my homeboys. He told me I had to come to prison so I could meet my father. Mm. Ironically, though, after he met his father, he made a complete shift from a semi-wild gang member to a devout Muslim. And he credited that to just getting gang from his father. Or, no, this might not be true. 
one thing I remember my grandmom telling me, and she was older at this time, and I don't know why I remember, I had to be like six years old when she said this. She said, hey, baby, you know, go to prison, you're going to come out a Muslim. That's what she told me. She lived in Philly. So, oh, uh, yeah. Like, yeah. So, are you Muslim because you went to prison and you need the protection or? No, nah, it's not like that in Arkansas. Arkansas is a completely different ball. But game. there are Muslims there. Yeah, but protection would have not even been one but of the you top joined five. the reasons. gang. So, it seems like you go to prison and you got to find a community. And maybe that's what my grandma was saying, right? You know, you. You got to find a community. If there's something that you resonate with, that becomes your gang, your tribe, your group. Are you saying that doesn't happen? In Arkansas, it's a different circumstances. Arkansas doesn't have much. The prison I was at, I was at the same prison for about five, six years. Mm -hmm. But there was relatively no structure whatsoever. So being Muslim was kind of being no different than being like a, a waiter at a restaurant. Like it's. It wasn't really just something special. Now, being a devout Muslim was different. Yeah. Right, I took my Shahada before going to prison. Just unfortunately, I wasn't living by the I dean. See. I see. Okay. It's kind of like a person get baptized for the first time, but then they go back into their old lifestyle. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. It was well, I, I guess my, my connecting point was your friend going to prison and meeting his father, becoming a better person, becoming a Muslim. Maybe it wasn't his father. I don't know. But my... The whole, re whole reason I'm saying all this is you probably, and this is just my, my opinion, you go to prison, you meet all these people who have absent fathers, and then there's people who meet their fathers in prison, and you see a problem. Man, there's a whole lot of people who have absent fathers that hate their fathers. When they get out, they don't care about them, whatever, and I'm going to teach you how to love your father. Not necessarily. Seems like it. One, I wrote on this topic because it was a personal topic to me because throughout my life not having my father, I struggled with real identity issues as most guys do when they don't have father Why figures. Why not write a book on that because that's something you actually went through. You have not gone through the process of loving your father. Because in my opinion, I've went through that process of loving my father. Like I've had my father, and this sounds strange, but the sense where I say I've had my father my entire life, Literally, you're, you're one of two different people, your mother, your father. They're always with you. They're always connected inside of you. And in a sense, I didn't have my father physically to groom me, but I always had my father's being in me because there's parts of me that I know that I didn't get from my mother that I had to come from him. And also from that concept of not having my father, it always drove me in certain areas to seek different truths. Like I'm... I'm not going to say I'm all the way glad I didn't I didn't have my father because, of course, I naturally I would have loved to have my father around. I would have loved to know him. But I know I wouldn't be who I am as a person or think the way I think if I did have him. Not having my father taught me to go seek different troops and not just go take things at face value. Like I always mention the part about my father being Ethiopian because the way the culture is set up, you usually live and do everything your parents say, whether it's right or wrong. This is what you go by. But because I didn't have that. I had to always go find and seek my own truths, my own identities, find out my own concepts, went through my own trials, experiences. I would have never had those if I had him. Yeah. Okay. The part about it, I know one of the ways I love my father is because I hated my father's people growing up because every time I seen them, I seen him. So I didn't want no dealings with them because in a sense, he abandoned me. And y'all already look at me some type of way because I'm not fully Ethiopian. So in a sense, I'm abandoned by y'all too. Yeah. But when I finally started to relinquish those feelings and actually started to embrace it, I'm fully involved in the community now. Now, granted, we got some ideological issues at hand right now, but I love these people to death. Mm. And honestly, I know for a fact it wasn't, if I didn't even start embracing that part of him that was me, I would never even want to see these people. You write another book. Don't you agree that you should have experience? And I, I guess you're saying you went through the experience of loving your one. Him hanging up on me was the one. Him hanging up on me was my big tester right there. Wow. Oh. Because I easily could have said this man's always rejected me. This man's always turned his back on me. This man's never there. It's I could have easily did that. Yes, it's a test. I don't think you hate your father. No, but I don't think you know if you love him or not. I know for a fact I do. Of course, you we don't can have say to say it. You don't have to believe it. Yes, you can say it, but there's no. 
Yes, based on your own definition, I think we can create whatever our reality is. But there are some people that have experienced having to love someone who despitefully uses them or hates them back. You just haven't been through that yet. You haven't been through, you, you can't, you can tell me that you love your father, but you can't argue the point that you've been through the process with your father to actually put it into practice. So in the Bible, there's a part where they say, if someone slaps you on your right side, offer them your left side to slap also. Or if someone tries to take your, your belt off from your coat, something like that, right? Every Christian who's a devout Christian would say, you know what? Somebody slaps me, I'll offer them my other side to slap because I'm that devout. No. Cap. Cap. What I'm saying is, but if I understand we, if, that's, if we, that's parable. Is, that's a parable. If we though. believe the scriptures. I believe I would do that. If we believe the scriptures, I think we can say anything. But until you're in that scenario, until you're in that situation, you don't know what you're going to do. You can't. You can't tell what you're going to do. Some people say, I'll die for my faith. Would you die for your faith? Yes, and I've been in that situation multiple times. Oh. I've stood in front of plenty of knives for the faith, willing to die at that moment. No hesitation. So I was going to kill you because of your faith? Actually, yeah, I got put in that situation before. What happened? Prison. Somebody got into one of the Muslims, and we're completely outnumbered. So now it's a situation where you're either going to run or you're going to take what comes with being it. I tell everybody else, I don't know what y'all going to do, but my mind was made up the moment I made the pledge. Nah, bro. Nah, fam. It's you and another person. You get involved with somebody else. There's, there's worse consequences to running in prison than dying. There's worse consequences. Your group, you're with them. You're in a situation. You realize they, they realize that you're not really with them because you ran. I've never been in that situation, so I don't know what that 100%. feels like. percent. So you didn't die for your faith. Like you, you didn't, you didn't say I'm gonna die for my faith. The person who flew that plane into the twin towers. Conspiracy. That, I mean, conspiracy. Based, okay. Well, you get what I'm saying. But people say they die for their faith, but we don't know. If you're saying there's a group of people, it's them and you, and they're saying, we're going to cut you right now. We're, we're, we're going to shoot you right now. If you don't denounce your faith, then we get to see, but you never get to tell the story about it. But we don't know what we're going to do in that situation. So I'm just, I'm just saying, you don't know what you're going to do because we haven't practiced it yet. My advice as an entrepreneur is to write another book or go make the stuff in your book true through practical application. That's my advice. I, you're 28 now, and maybe you'll understand what I'm saying when you're 35, 36. Inshallah. Inshallah. It means if God wills. Oh. You a Muslim too? You Muslim? You practiced it though? You just know some friends. Okay. Some friends. You in Atlanta right now. This is this Muslims all over Atlanta right now. So yeah, knowledge sure. is I'm easy. Just saying, I, the knowledge is easy, I think. Nah, he was just trying to educate me. So I'm like, he just it's like you got Spanish friends, you're like, hola. You're like, you got Spanish friends? No, I just know hola. Like, <laughs> okay. Um that would probably be my advice, man. You want a thriving career? And again, you can take the book and go sell the book as much as you want. And I think who you are, the way you present yourself, the way you talk, you'll sell a bunch of books. It's just I, I don't know if I would even feel comfortable even advising you, giving you strategy on how to sell more books because in my heart, I believe that you have no idea what you're talking about. Not no idea. I'm saying that for dramatic effect. But <laughs> I said that for the clip. But I think you have an understanding and you're going to be on the right path, but you need to go make that stuff in that book true. 
It's not yet. You have any questions? Would you like to read the book? No, of course not. <laughs> Absolutely not. Because in a sense, you don't really know what all I talked about in the book. I know you're not the right person to be advising me if I'm going through that situation. You don't have the experience. You can read it to find out. I, I, I've, I've, I'm busy. We got an audio version. <laughs> <laughs> you got an Amazon believe, Prime, it's free. I believe it's good information in it, but it's going to be really hard to brand it because once you really, when people real, okay, here's some good advice. Do not let people know the limited interaction that you've had with your father or the limited I've had a few. I've had a few. I've had a few more prior to that one phone call. It's just that was the solidifier for me. In jail. Yeah, he actually he reached out to my he reached out to my mother and said he wanted to be in my life, but that was really a lie. He actually wanted to get in a relationship with my mom, but just wanted to use me as the bait. Here's what I think could have happened, and if you really, really love this man, you'd figure this out. First time you call, you say, "Hey, I'm your son." He hangs up. What's going on on the other line? Who knows? Maybe he's in the streets. Maybe he's got a lot going on. He thinks somebody's playing on his phone. You call back. He sits there and listens. You're talking. You're talking. Talking. Maybe he's reflecting in his mind saying, I don't even know what to say. I have no idea what to say. I don't have the words. I didn't practice for this moment. Uh, I called that same number for a week. Every time I went straight to voicemail. I understand. Yeah, I called and text for a I week understand. straight. He doesn't know what to say. And maybe he's feeling bad about himself. I know for a fact he is. A hundred percent. So you go to his house one time and that time he's not home, but you give no effort to actually give him an opportunity to face to face to maybe give him some of the words to say. That's love. Love is you trying everything in your power to protect this person. You're not. I went out my way to find him. No, I mean. When I say I went out my way to find him, I walked all. I walked through every part of Philly. I heard he might be at for three hours in the cold. It's I don't December. believe that because we just went through this whole situation, and you said you you asked him, "Hey, when you go up, the, like, the roommate was the, said, no." The roommate was left. the last part. Was the last part place I went to, but I walked beforehand all through West Philly in the cold. I think I actually met up. I met up my. I aunt. think you're making this part up. No, I went. Maybe that's some information. I think you would have like brought out earlier. So I don't believe that part. Because at that point, it, it don't really but matter to me. It don't really matter. It's I walk trying to find them. I even went to the Ethiopian community because one thing is Ethiopians don't hang out outside their own kind. So Good. asked, described them. I even went to the bar him and my mom met at. Okay. <laughs> I went to go see the owner because the owner, he actually right. said he remembered my mom. Okay. So I gave him the information and. He said, if I hear something, I'll let you know. But again, he can't let me know because I changed the number the that next was a year day. Ago. That was a year now. I ain't been back to Philly since. Yeah. The number he had is no longer connected. Yeah. You're, okay. And I think the only issue we have is our definition of love is drastically different. Exactly. So. The thing about words, words have literal definitions, but then they have what they mean to everybody else. Like it's one thing I can ask you yeah. what a word means, but I can also ask you what it means to you. For sure. So, I mean, even in cultures, words don't even mean the same thing in different cultures. Do me a favor. Start cross-examining your definition of love with other people. Start talking to people. I do. I'm, I'm a very curious person on what and people. you still think the effort that you gave was love? Oh, I'm not done yet. Okay. All right. Well, I just got to get a little advice, bit more creative. Advice, go make that stuff true in your book or write another book. You could read the book, though, and find out what is actually in the book so you can make that judgment. Because I didn't really tell you, like, the contents in the book or the steps or none of that. I wouldn't listen, though. It's almost like someone writing a book on how to make it to the NBA has never made it to the NBA or even helped someone make it to the NBA. So why would I read that book? I think that's a little different in context. That's the same. But this was a very helpful conversation. Do you have any last words? Uh, actually, it's a pleasure talking to you. I put myself in this situation just to see, can I take a little bit of criticism? <laughs> and to learn from you, of course, I think you're a great interviewer. Thank you, man. And maybe all of this stuff, I'm going to end on a high note. 
maybe all of the stuff that I'm talking about is just my own opinion. And I could be wrong. And maybe after this conversation, you leave here and say, yo, I am actually going to go get some results. And I'm going to help thousands of people start loving their absent fathers. And Dave doesn't know what he's talking about. And this could be the motivation or inspiration that you needed to put a battery in your back to go get it. Cool? Yes, sir. I'm in. I'm still going to give you a copy of the book, whether you read or not. <laughs> if you like the video that you just watched, click this one. You're going to like this one, maybe even more. Click it right now.